Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please remember to stay in touch, as that helps promote our channel. And click notifications so you know when a new lesson is available. We sometimes respond to current events if they involve space science. Like when everyone was panicked over something we've known for half a century. A little perspective can sometimes help. Starship Integrated Test Flight 3 is getting ready. Here we see the Flight Termination System team practicing. We will try to live stream that event for our Patreon supporters. But today, we are going to look at hypersonic retropropulsive reentry. This is what SpaceX uses to bring back their Falcon 9 first stage rocket. It is not a new concept, but no one had accomplished this before SpaceX. The SpaceX Falcon 9 first stage uses nine Merlin engines to get the second stage started on its way to space. Let's look at the altitude and velocity of separation. Here we see MECO or main engine cutoff. This is where the rocket shuts down its booster engines and starts to coast. There is a pause here so that any residual propellant can expand and exit. When SpaceX was launching the Falcon 1, the second stage was separated too soon and expanding gases surged the now much lighter first stage forward, causing it to collide with and destroy the second stage. Now they have this all figured out, and the Falcon 9 is flying and landing with incredible dependability. The same cannot be said yet for Starship. The first integrated test flight was a launch success, but failed to separate. This caused the ship and booster to spin out of control, requiring activation of the flight termination system resulting in the loss of both stages. The second integrated flight went with hot staging separation. If you did your homework and watched CSI Starbase, you learned all about this mission. There are a lot of benefits to hot staging. One is that my entire lesson on an escape abort system is obviated. Because if anything goes wrong with the booster, the Starship can now spin itself up and escape. Though I still think the nose cone should be able to separate and land on its own both for lunar missions and in case of emergencies whenever it's carrying people. Another benefit of hot staging is that you don't lose as much velocity on separation. When Elon said that hot staging would allow the Starship to get more mass to orbit, some people commented that it would not, as mass to orbit is determined by the rocket equation. The second point is true. The rocket equation does indeed define the limitations of any rocket system. But the first statement is wrong. When we shut off the main engines on the booster, we are still under gravity drag. Gravity at this altitude is pretty much the same as on the surface. The minute these engines quit firing, you start losing velocity and altitude. When the second stage separates, the rocket equation starts all over. In fact, this is not a complete rocket equation. This is. And it starts from your current velocity. At launch, that's zero and can be ignored, but when we can hot stage without losing too much ground, we can indeed get more mass to orbit and still be within the limits of the rocket equation. That being said, I'm going to ask you an important question. The booster does not have any heat tiles on it. At about 9 pounds per cubic foot, that saves several tons of mass. The booster will flip and fly itself back toward the launch site. Since its mass is so much less, this doesn't take nearly as much propellant as it did to get up here carrying the Starship. Just as it is entering the atmosphere, the booster will fire its engines again. Just as it starts to create a shock wave, the engine blast pushes the shock wave away from the booster, protecting the base from the heat of atmospheric reentry. Now there are two components to reentry: heat pulse, how high does the temperature go? and heat load. How long does the ship get exposed to that heat? We all know that if we toss a hot potato from hand to hand fast enough, we don't get burned, as the heat doesn't have the time to soak in. On the other hand, even our best ablative heat shields would fail if they stayed in the heat for too long. The Falcon 9 and later Starship boosters are not coming back from orbital velocity. Minimum orbital velocity is about 7,800 meters per second. This is 28,000 kilometers per hour or 17,500 miles per hour. Ablative heat shields burn away, 
creating gas and carrying away the heat of reentry. But the booster is only going about one-fourth of orbital velocity when it hits the atmosphere. So about 1,950 meters per second, 7,000 kilometers per hour, or 4,400 miles per hour. The reason SpaceX gave up using parachutes was because even this velocity created enough heat to destroy the booster before it could slow down and deploy its parachutes. The Falcon 9 booster fires three of its engines, wiping out about half of its velocity and creating a shield that pushes the shockwave away. As we will remember, on re-entry, there is a stagnation layer of air in front of the ship, with a compression wave in front, creating temperatures as high as 1,650 Celsius. After this burn, the booster can survive the rest of the fall, guiding itself with grid fins, passing through the sound barrier, and reaching terminal velocity, which is dealt with just before landing. The Starship booster will work exactly the same way. Here's my question. The Falcon 9 booster is made mostly of aluminum and carbon fiber. These materials can't withstand more than about 200 Celsius. Steel can survive about seven times this temperature. Could the Starship get rid of all its heat tiles and re-enter the atmosphere base first? blasting its engines to slow down, and shielding itself during re-entry. Then turn horizontally to reduce its terminal velocity. Assuming a 10% propellant reserve and a 7,800 meter per second re-entry approach velocity, how much propellant would it take to reduce the Starship's velocity to 2,000 meters per second? And if the heat tiles on the Starship are 4 inches or about 10 centimeters thick, and have a mass of around 9 pounds per cubic foot, or about 155 kilograms per cubic meter, would the propellant mass needed to stop the ship be a lot more than the mass of the heat tiles? And even if it is, do you think the Starship should try this maneuver, to take the stress off the thermal tiles on re-entry for added safety? And finally, SpaceX has been talking about a larger version of Starship, up to 150 meters tall. I want you to consider a new Starship design, 18 meters in diameter and 200 meters tall. This ship will have a 120 meter tall booster, a 60 meter tall second stage, and a 20 meter tall third stage. Each of the stages will re-enter base first, using thrust to reduce speed and protect itself. The third stage will use Raptor sea level engines around the circumference an actively cooled dome as a heat sink, very similar to what Stokes Space is planning. The added area on re-entry, going from 63.62 square meters to 254.5 square meters, will help reduce our velocity faster. However, the faster you slow down, the higher your heat pulse. But if you take too long to slow down, then your heat load is too high. Now on this ship, we are going to consider concentric tanks. This should add extra support for the mass. So instead of the propellant tanks being stacked, we are going to place the oxygen tank, the smaller of the two at 40% of the available volume, on the inside, with the rest on the outside, 60% of the volume, used for methane. We can also use the methane to help cool the base of our ships as we're coming back down. What will be the diameter of the central tank to make this work? All of that is your homework for next week. Let us know what you come up with, and stay safe. Hello fellow space scholars. I wanted to thank you for being here. This channel started four years ago for many reasons. One of them is that I love to teach and have always wanted to learn how to create video lessons. Another was my frustration at the lack of facts in space news. I wanted to make sure that those truly interested in space science had somewhere to go to learn about the equations that make rockets possible, to give you the tools to make your own evaluations of different launch systems. But as important as understanding the equations are, they limit my channel to those with a serious interest in understanding space science. As many of you know, the YouTube algorithm promotes broad topics that are easy to understand. Our space science lessons, however, require a more detailed understanding, and I don't want to dumb the lessons down. But that makes the target audience a lot smaller. 
to take this channel to the next level will require that I invest more time and resources, and that will require your help. Therefore, I really need your support via Patreon or YouTube membership. Just a little bit every month can make a huge difference, and would be greatly appreciated. I thank you so much, dear friends of Rocket Technology, for your continued support, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you, and stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra.